You've covered quite a few really interesting stories. I've been following your work on YouTube around the grievance studies hoax and the Evergreen situation, the Evergreen obviously where Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying were and they've been on the channel a few times in the past mm -hmm. and the grievance studies piece which was Peter Bogosian, um, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay and submitting the, the papers to the journals mm -hmm. and yeah I'm really interested in talking to you about that experience and also kind of some of the ethical or, or moral dilemmas that that has kind of thrown up for all everyone who's kind of paying attention to these extremely politicized mm. hot button topics um, but I'd like to just start to so how did you first become involved in in this well I was looking into activism at the start that was something that I wanted to make a film on I think the just the sheer pro proliferation of activism and how much of it we were seeing was something that seemed um, significant to me and I, w I just wanted to figure out what was going on there um, there was a particular group of activists within the whole realm of activism. Um, I didn't know what they were at the time, but I probably call them left-wing utopians now. Um, and it seemed like there, there was this there was this spirit of revenge in there. There was something destructive in inside their activism, um, and I don't feel like they were being reported on properly through the media. I work within a news network back home, and the the reports were a little bit off about these these particular activists and so I took it upon myself to go study them and to figure out what was going on there and it was the language that they were using that um, I mean all roads led back to the academy things they were using terminology like uh, cis normativity there was expansion and contraction of concepts that I thought I'd already known um, I thought these concepts were quite strange and I found them interesting and so I started hanging out at um, protests and rallies back home because it seemed like more of them were popping up and speaking to these people and just monitoring the digital activism that was, was taking place. And um, a lot of the, the concepts were coming from cultural studies in, in the universities. So that led me to um, the academy, speaking to people within these kind of critical cultural uh, studies um, disciplines and taking some of the studies to statisticians, speaking to philosophers, just to kind of get a bit of a, a read on what the hell was going on, because it seemed um, something big culturally was taking place here. Um, and eventually that led me to cross paths with Peter Bogosian, one of the Australian academics I talked talk to. I was um, saying you should speak to this guy who's quite vocal about um, about you know being in opposition to these 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 studies where a lot of this stuff was coming from and then he he opened up to me and told me that he was uh, about to undergo a secret project with helen pluckrose and james Lindsay. and i mean it just it was all there it was this uh this kind of fierce academic landscape to make a film with pete is a bit of a weird guy so we've got an eccentric character i can play with and so it looked like a good film to me and i just started pursuing it yeah, and I'd love to start with Evergreen because I think you, you called it a case study and I think it is, it's the most compelling vision I've seen of how the, for want of a better word, like intersectional or social justice ideology can turn into this very strange um, authoritarian force inside an institution. Mm. I'd love to play a clip from that, uh, the canoe, which is just mm. the most incredible scene. Yeah. And I'd love if you could just talk through what's going on in that scene and yeah. what, what, what you thought when you first saw it. So at, at the time uh, that the Evergreen story kind of fell into my lap, I was looking at the scholarship and it looked like it was something more akin to theology than um, any kind of social science. It was more, it was more um, feeling out a moral system as opposed to some kind of you know scientific process a lot of it anyway the deepest darkest kind of postmodern side of this scholarship and so it did really have this moral kind of religious element to it and around that time when I was just getting my head around this stuff the um, uh, Brett and Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying had written a um, a story for the Washington Examiner and they they linked to this piece of footage, which was later I made it into this uh, a scene within the um, series that I that I put up. It was the infamous canoe scene, um, and 
it was just it was one of the more fascinating things I've ever seen. It was just uh, people that were. It's really hard to explain. Well, you're probably going to have to show it for people to understand what took place there. And we're going to ask for key stakeholders that are on this campus to get on board our journey to equity. So what I'm going to do first is ask, this is the council. Our council is large, expansive. And we're going to and we're going to get on a canoe. It was a group. The Equity Council of Evergreen State College had been given um, a project to create a um, an equity proposal to change certain parts of the college, and they had this event, which wasn't really to talk over the equity plan, which which they were mandated to create. Brett even said that they hadn't sent out the equity plan no. to anyone in there before they had the meeting. No, they didn't. He had to follow it up himself. So it was like, we're going to have this, this equity plan meeting, um, which was kind of billed as a discussion, I think. But what took place was, was more of a, a church service. It really did. It really felt like that. Um, there was a very kind of authoritarian, if you're not if you're not for this plan, you're against us. It was. It, was, it looked to me a moral community that was policing the outskirts. It was you're, you're either for us or, or against us. And we're going to get on a canoe that's going to sometimes have fierce waves, unbearable headwinds, and sometimes intentional or unintentional extra rocking of the boat because we're not on the same page or on the same heartbeat. If we need to have our canoe, and John, let me know if this is not okay. Can there be, can it be three wide? Two wide, okay, so we gotta make this happen. You know, emotionally I'm on board with the idea of, you know, a canoe journey to somewhere, but this looked like they had cloaked a freight train in the imagery of a canoe. Oh, hold on one second, hold on. Um, the senior administrators, um, you have to ask for permission and commit some things before boarding the canoe. So can we step back out? So uh, I would like to board the canoe because I'm committed to enhancing and furthering inclusion and equity in our campus community among both students and staff, faculty, and to do that with compassion and kindness. Um, personally, I am committed to making Evergreen a more student-ready campus, and as provost, I am committing resources to help train our faculty to become, to be able to promote equity and inclusion in the classroom and outside the classroom. There's a way in which you just, there's a sea of people engaged in a shared delusion and then there's a few people witnessing the delusion and isolated, unable to exchange words or anything. That sense of being alone in a crowd is profound and that, that really was how that meeting felt. And in a crowd of people who are supposed to be your colleagues. Yeah, who are sleepwalking. People were asked to first say that they were um, on board with this equity plan and then they would step on this imaginary canoe and then um, move together off to this, this magical land of equity. I know that sounds, it sounds insane, but uh, this is the piece of footage that was sitting in front of me. And so I saw this and I was already looking at this from the grievance studies perspective. Um, and it was just clear to me, I have to get this into my film somehow. Yeah. And so what I did, because Pete is friends with uh, Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, we, we sat down and they took me through the whole evergreen experience that they had. And um, yeah, I turned it into a series, which will then be condensed into a scene for the, the feature film that I'm, I'm trying to create. Yeah, and I want to say that that series on Evergreen, I think, 
I mean, I knew about the Evergreen story and I'd obviously talked to Heather and to, to Brett quite a bit in the past, mm. but it wasn't really until seeing that, especially the canoe scene, but yeah. the whole atmosphere of those films that you put together that yeah. it becomes really real. Yeah. And I'd really highly advise anyone who hasn't seen them to watch them because it just, you called it the case study and I'd, I'd agree it's, it's the kind of perfect example of what happens when this, um, I guess any, any, any belief system can become an ideology yeah. at times, but yeah. it shows that there is something sinister if these ideas are pushed to that, yeah. to that extreme. This particular worldview of uh, systems of power being perpetuated through language, it's, mm. I, I know it's, it's strange and academic, but it's a particular worldview that if it gets to critical mass, you're probably going to see something within a closed system, right? Like Evergreen is... A, it's a perfect case study for this thing because it's like a town. You've got your students, which are the populace. You've got the administration, which are um, you know your governance. You've got police services. You've got food services. You've got housing, and so it's almost like this this perfect kind of uh, well case study. It's a petri dish. Petri dish. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you want to take a moral angle on it, but um, I mean it was, and it's it's it is. It's the canary in the coal mine, as far as I can see, is because if you roll these ideas out, they are built in such a way where that is the inevitable conclusion. And I think Benjamin Boyce is another one that um, his work I lent on quite a bit as research to create my series, and he has delved into this uh, a whole other level. So it's it's worth looking at his stuff as well. But um, yeah, it, it's it's an indication of what could potentially happen if this this postmodern um, left-wing utopian way is actually implemented in larger and larger scales. It's concerning. And with the the, the grievance studies piece, yeah. what what happened? Because I understand that it was they they were in in the process of submitting more than the seven papers they got published, mm -hmm. but the whole thing got wrapped up. And yeah. so, what was that like being sort of? So I think I think the Washington was it the Wall Street Journal that was yeah. about to publish on it. So um, in the end, it, they had to make it public yeah. uh, quite quickly. How was that being in the middle of that? Um, that was interesting. So they had I think it was five papers that had been published, and the most ridiculous one, which was about studying dog humping incidents to prove um, some kind of. Um, to prove rape culture as evidence of rape culture, how people spoke about um, witnessing dog humping incidents. Okay. Is the light okay in here? Yeah, yeah. I just read my email. We have our first win. The dog park paper has been accepted. They don't know. We're about to tell them. Gotta read you something. Dear Dr. Helen Wilson, <laughs> I have now closely considered the revisions of your manuscript, Dog Park, and, <laughs> and will recommend its publication in Gender, Place, and Culture. You have done very good work to address the issues your viewers raised and have clarified your arguments. Thank you for your contribution to Gender, Place, and Culture, and I hope to be seeing your manuscript in print. Yours truly. PhD managing editor. <laughs> we have an accepted paper in the number one feminist geography journal. Since approximately June of 2017, I, along with two other concerned academics, Peter Bergoshin and Helen Pluckrose, have been writing intentionally broken academic papers and submitting them to highly respected journals in fields that study gender, race, sexuality, and similar topics. We did this to expose a political corruption that's taken hold of the university. By this point, several of these papers have been accepted in highly respected journals, and one that claims that dog humping incidents can be taken as evidence of rape culture has been officially honored as excellent scholarship. I'm not going to lie to you, we had a lot of fun with this project. The, the reviewers are worried that we didn't respect the dog's privacy. <laughs> That's the concern. We respected the <laughs> But don't let that lead you to believe that we're not addressing a serious problem. If you have a few minutes, I'll try to explain. And so it was this really ludicrous paper, and it had been published, and a young journalist had found, had found it and was saying, there's something wrong here. And so she started looking into it, and um, 
eventually like eventually got in contact with the journals and so the journals were contacting um, Jim's fake account for this thing and so it was the pressure the pressure at that point was rising and I mean it's great from a filmmaking perspective but these guys are my friends now so it's like yeah, I got a bit of involved in, 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 in this kind of the wheels were falling off um, the project that they'd done and so at one point that the younger journalist led to another journalist at the Wall Street Journal um, catching wind of what was going on and so the, Wall, the older journalist at the Wall Street Journal had um, contacted the journal, contacted uh, the, the fake account and saying we don't, we don't think this paper you've done, is, is, we've created is way too ridiculous, we don't think you are a scholar, what's going on here? And so at that point it was for the group, it was, do we lie to continue this and land more papers because there was a lot more in circulation that was possibly getting published? Or, um, or do we just come clean and, and let the Wall Street Journal know and finish this thing almost a year before they intended to finish? Um, so they, they decided to come clean because it, you know, it would have been a case of forging documents in order to keep, keep the ruse going. And so, that was an interesting thing to face um, because I don't think they were ready for the onslaught that was about to take place. I don't think they were ready for the, uh, the potential shaming and be able to communicate this really complex thing. Like even the, I was there for the conversations with uh, Gillian Melchor at the Wall Street Journal and you could tell, she, she was sharp as hell, she's like a, a really good journalist, but you could tell that there was kind of a disconnect between what they were trying to say because they're speaking in this academic language. I'd been hanging out with them for a year and a half and I was only just starting to find my feet in what the hell they were talking about. And so it, by that time I was friends with them and I knew that they weren't going to be able to communicate this properly to the public. And so um, having a background in news media and um, been in the middle of you know, one of these uh, well, it's, it's press circuses before and seen how it kind of works, then um, I helped them to create um, uh, content of their own and just, just a little bit of media training and just what found, helped them find ways to communicate this infinitely complex thing that wasn't going to make them look like these kind of misogynist, racist people that it was clear they were going to be um, accused of being, uh, and so it was. It was. It was quite a. It was quite an interesting experience. And I think the the rule is is if you win the first the narrative within the first forty eight hours, you're probably going to be okay. And so it was about getting their version of the events out to as many people as humanly possible. And so we we created this big list of um, journalists that would potentially write favorably about it. Um, created a, uh, put all, all the evidence, all the peer review comments, um, all the papers themselves into a big Google file and then sent that link out to whoever wanted it. And um, yeah, created a write-up to try and explain the, 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 the project to the public so they wouldn't be um, totally slaughtered. And it seemed, I think at the end of the day, on balance, they, I think they came out on top, which, was, which is great because it, it started a conversation about this stuff. I think you said before that you did make a sort of decision to go from observer to participant. Yeah. And that's something I feel with a lot of people in this area who are covering a lot of these stories is that's a really hard, I mean, I know as a journalist, like I feel that, that, that the difficulty of that tension, yeah. it's like if you, if you go from being a part, a, 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 an observer to a top participant, how do you maintain kind of journalistic objectivity or the objectivity of a storyteller? Well, I guess, I guess I'm a storyteller, not a journalist, so I guess there's a little bit of leeway there, um, a little bit of poetic license, I guess. But I think what, the way I'm going to handle it is I'm working toward a feature-length film about the, uh, about the project, and I'm just going to put it in. Like, I'll just um, make no bones about it. I did cross the line, and I did um, participate at some point. Um, but I think that to me that's part of the story being interesting and um, just being honest about that. I think that, that people can take or leave it or, you know, crucify me if they want. As long as I'm honest, then that's cool. Yeah. And how, yeah, because there's a lot of accusations within this space as well of, of mm. that, that the, the grifting tag is, mm. is thrown around quite a lot. And I know Peter sort of talked about that in the past. Yeah. Um, 
And I do think that, that there is a temptation to, like audience capture is a thing, yeah. giving people what they want is a thing, and there are sort of ethical boundaries that can get blurred. Yeah. Are you, do you think about that in what you're doing? Yeah, I do. Um, I guess, I mean, I'm reluctant to even do this kind of stuff. Like it's, it's, it's strange to kind of step out into the public. I, I just want to, I want to do this kind of stuff insofar as it can help me just make films. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a strange thing to step out in the public and watch Helen, Peter and Jim step out in the public and all the conversations that go into, uh, you know, protecting an image. Um, there's something off-putting to me about that. Like I'm reluctant to step out into the public because I don't want to have to manage that. I just want to just do what I want to do. And, um, you know, I, I guess... Being honest is my true north. And so if I get into trouble for being honest and hanging out with the wrong people, then so be it. I kind of want to be the, the, how I, I want to behave how I want the world to be. And I want the world not to give a shit about, uh, let's say, guilt by association anymore. Because I don't think, yeah, I don't know. It could get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> What's been the most difficult thing about the moral dilemmas? I don't tend to have personal moral dilemmas about it because I don't feel like I'm doing anything wrong. I'm just looking at something that interests me and I'm uh, pulling the curtain back on something. I've got my position on it. If you don't agree with that, then let's talk about that. I don't actually feel the moral dilemma. The moral dilemma comes from um, the outside, the way that people are perceiving me. And so that's, that's, the, that's the dilemma is, is, is participating with these guys and who were seen as provocateurs um, is that going to, um, well it has, made, made getting funding for this film more difficult or, um, or are platforms not going to then buy the film that I'm trying to make as my first feature length film as a result of me, um, I don't know, being too honest about my position about this thing. So that, that is where the dilemma, <laughs> the dilemma lies is um, should I be protecting my image around this stuff more than I am or yeah I, can you talk to me about what you think the moral dilemma there is because I don't actually physically feel it I know that there was something wrong with it but it came from the way that um, I thought that I would be perceived more than any kind of internal sense of this is wrong I feel the, the moral dilemma as in if I was if I was in your position pitching it to <clears throat> mainstream broadcasters that it's it's hard like and, and, and acknowledging that because they're seen and accused in some places of like highly politicized yeah. um, that, that effectively they what they were doing was highly politicized um, provocateur mm. prov provocation uh, it didn't prove the things that they wanted it to it was um, unethical etc mm. etc mm. to if that's how it's seen by at least some some people and that has some traction into the mainstream as well yeah. then being seen to be actually part of the project rather than just observing the project mm -hmm. is a really difficult line to 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 walk totally. and, I, and I, I feel that for sure and it's yeah. like um, so yeah that, that would be my, my my question from a sort of a journalistic or an editorial perspective yeah, yeah. it strikes me more of a <laughs> practical problem right like I know that I'm um, missing out on a lot of opportunities by delving into these interesting areas, but um, personally, it's not. It's, it doesn't feel moral to me. Like it's, it's how the crowd views you. And I'm, a, I'm having a bit of trouble with that. It's like, how do you? I mean, the devil's in the details. It'll be in the film. I'll be honest about it. And if you don't like it, then so be it. But I, I think that this whole guilt by association thing, I don't. It, it can't continue, can it? It's just. It's bullshit. Mm. Doesn't mean it can't continue. <laughs> <laughs> it probably will continue. But I mean... But yeah. it's constantly, I mean, it's just something that I'm constantly aware of um, in, in all the work, having kind of started off the channel making films about Jordan Peterson mm. and him, not that, he wasn't quite as controversial a figure then as he is now, but knowing that that's, that he's very controversial, yeah. that there's many different kind of Jordan Petersons as well and kind of trying to kind of understand and tell all of that story um, and, and also, yeah, being, I, I guess all we can do is be true to our own ethical sense. Mm. Like I'm, my ethical sense is sort of, 
I, I feel the need to ask the difficult questions, yeah. um, but also to tell the truth as much as I can in, mm. in what, I'm, what I'm doing. And I've asked, I've done some punchy interviews with people that I felt that there are things that they need to ask. Yeah. And I also will try to ask questions like the questions I've asked to you that I yeah. feel are, are valid um, questions that a skeptical observer might want to ask. Yeah. Because I also think it's not of any service to the person I'm interviewing if I don't ask those questions. Because yeah, yeah. if, if you don't, if, if you're not asked those questions and you don't get the chance to respond, mm. then, then you then might not even know that that's an issue. Or you yeah. might not know it's an issue or it actually gives people a lot more most people know what's being said about them yeah. by people on the other side. So yeah. not giving them the opportunity to say that yeah, is, I yeah, think, a, a real... Yeah. yeah, you're not addressing it and you're not giving them the opportunity to put their side of the, of the story. Yeah. I think that's a really important part yeah. of, the, of the So what are, we, what are we talking about? True North is truth then, is some kind of truth. Because you're, you're, you've got an inner sense which guides you toward what you want, what you have to ask to feel good about yourself. Or it's we just to be honest about those questions that are yeah. niggling you. I think we all do on some level, but we also understand that there are um, other factors pulling us in different directions. Like there is an audience capture, yeah. especially on YouTube. YouTube leans leans more right than other social media yeah. spheres, Pro mostly because I think there's so many of the the topics that people want to see covered are not covered on the mainstream media, or they're yeah. covered through a very um, often quite sort of naively uh, liberal lens. Yeah. And so that's what has fueled the growth of YouTube is that people are getting other perspectives yeah. where they felt they weren't getting them on the mainstream media. Yeah. But then that audience itself starts to kind of pull in a certain direction. Yeah. So there's a and Darwinian effect all... towards it's playing to win, right? It's not playing yeah. to be honest. Yeah. I, I, I was just I was thinking I've got a friend who's quite famous back home and um, she talks about this. She was like saying she wanted to post something. And um, she was like, oh, no, I couldn't post that. I'm like, what do you mean? You're the one with the audience. You're not working for anyone. It doesn't just post it. And she was like, no, 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 that will upset that. That will upset that. And it was just, a, it was just an instance of thinking you're, you're caged in by your audience. You're, they're speaking through you. You're not, even, you're not even being yourself. And, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's got to be an issue. There's something ha hanging out with all these academics as well. There's something deep inside an academic to care so much about their, the way they're perceived. I think a lot of their career progression is, is branding. Yeah. Um, I just I see the weight of that and I'm like, oh, I don't want to play that game. I don't even want to get in front of the camera. I just want to make films. So, yeah, I mean, it's something, it's something that I've, I'm interested in because it's particularly with social media, it's such a big thing now. Everyone, the brand and the you, um, yeah. how, are they, how are they interacting and how do you not forget yourself, you know, become yeah. the brand at some point. But, um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, this kind of gap that opens up between a public persona and the real person, I think, is like this sort of yawning void. Mm. The great book, The Circle, have you read The Circle? No, I um, by Dave Eggers, who wrote, uh, uh, his first book was called... A, a you know, heartbreaking work of staggering genius. Right. Uh, and The Circle, as a book, was really, really clever in the way it kind of just um, talks about the hole that opens up between, um, as almost like yawning gap between the person you're presenting to the world and mm. your worries about how that person's coming across and yeah. then your actual, the, your true north, your, yeah. your actual truth and how yeah. that's um, compromised in the process. Wow, she's getting deep. <laughs> well, it reminds me of what, what's, what a lot of these things are covering, like these, uh, these academic fields. There's, a lot of them are identity studies. And so first you've got to ask what the hell is an identity before you start playing with, with, with what, you know, what makes you you. And um, I think that a lot of the essential features that are, that are guiding, uh, that are kind of gathering uh, groups together, uh, like things like uh, your sexual identity or your racial identity. It's only a very small part of you. And if you, um, a lot of these, these fields are, are saying that that is you, that, that that's your main... Uh, essence. Essence, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we should read the world through these, these group identity um, markers. And it's just, it's so, it's so odd to me, yeah. Yeah, the other, the other factor that this, this whole area brings up for me is this sort of sense of um, polarisation and um, kind of the circling of the wagons around different experiences. And you must have had that experience. Like how, 
in real time, you talked about the press onslaught and mm. the, the fact that kind of you were then in the centre of this mm. kind of maelstrom. Mm. maelstrom. It seems very difficult to then um, communicate outside that bubble, so very easy to get trapped in a bubble. Mm. Do, do, you, do you worry about that? In what sense? Could you, could you elaborate that on that a little bit? In, so um, trapped in a bubble is in... Ooh. Ooh. Well, with that amount of attention on us, yeah. we tend to get sort of defensive. We tend yeah. to get like academic academia and knowledge in general mm. relies on us being open to changing our ideas yeah, and having yeah, conversations. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it seems very difficult in the middle of these, these kind of massive um, media storms. Well, it's, not, it's not possible. Like you yeah. have to put up a front. Like that's, I think that's a big part of what, when the media explosion happened and um, how I was useful there was, was to create a meme version of the uh, the you know something that's understandable of, of the project, and then introduce we we were talking about the spear like you need that spear tip to penetrate so people can kind of understand it and then only then you can start to move down to the more complex layers. So it's um, it's not not in a in a media storm it's not possible. You're not getting um, you're not getting a accurate description of the underlying events. I think that that's, I think, yeah, the news media is kind of like a, this, this mythological thing. As I've, I've had experience of, of being um, part of a media storm before. I think my first film, my first film was about um, an experience I had where I, where I filmed a racist incident uh, on a bus. And I then made a video of that and uploaded it um, to YouTube in revenge for these guys who were being racist dicks. I felt like they had one over me and it was a personal thing, I guess. Um, and that just, it got taken up into the media and there was this big circus whirlwind around it. And my experience of the, the underlying story and what took place on that bus and what was being reported just diverge further and further away from each other. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, once you're in, once you've been through a big storm like that, you, you do get a sense, well, it's happened to me twice now with, with this thing, you get a sense of how bad the, um, the media machine is for communicating any kind of nuance or what was actually happening there. Like it's, it's these strange little collapsed meme versions of, of what happened. Um, and now they're politicized, like you've got the right wing take and the, the left wing take. You've, you've got um, uh, the lens through which they interpret the underlying events, which are kind of infinitely complex most of the time, are, uh, are simplified. And so when, once, you've, once you've been through one of these things, you start looking, you start reading um, media interpretations of events and, and just and not seeing the truth there. It's, it's, uh, it's bullshit. Yeah, well, it's, fake news is a, is, is a thing. <laughs> I think people are getting a sense of that as well. What would you say are the biggest things that you've learnt over the last two years of following these projects? Biggest thing I've learnt? You can pick more than one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole thing's being a learning pro, pro, process. Like I think I found out very early on that uh, in order to have a perspective to tell this story, I needed to study what uh, Helen, Pete and Jim were studying um, because otherwise I was just the conduit for what they were saying, you know. First of all, I had to figure out whether they were talking shit, um, or there was something to what they were saying. And so the process has been um, a lot of study. I guess it's like a DIY masters that, that I've been doing with this um, with this film. And so, I mean, I can't. It's so complicated that I can't give you this pithy answer. I've learnt this, and this is what's going on. It's a, a deeper understanding of the philosophical underpinnings of what um, these critical studies are about and what their effect on culture in a larger sense. Um, and how would you summarise that? Well, that's the difficult thing. I guess it's, uh, it's, it's uh, criticism with no, with no solutions, I guess. If you really had to, to drill down to what is actually going on there, the method is criticise something until people are disenfranchised and then create some kind of revolution. So it's, it's, it's the, the thing that's memed out and the thing that um, a lot of people are picking up and it's having a really big cultural effect right now is the criticism, it's the complaining. Um, without, it's cynical complaining, right? Like you need, you need the complainers to keep you in check if you're, uh, if you're 
um, not looking after certain groups or you're you know you're becoming too capitalist and and you know hurting the environment and things like that but there is uh, if you don't look at the practical nature of the thing and and look at it with a bit of love if you're just completely cynical and you criticize it the norms that they're criticizing um, there's something wrong there there's something wrong there and I think it's having an outsized cultural effect right now and I think a lot of us are sensing that and where does the film go from here? It, waiting to see what happens with, with Peter Boghossian mm. and because I guess that's the kind of end, end of the film as yeah. to what happens to, to him. Yeah, so I've captured all the events. Um, I feel like I'm getting to a point where I can say something meaningful about um, the subject matter and so I'll, I'll inject that into it. Um, but the, the final point is the investigations against Pete at PSU are ongoing. So. I'm just waiting until that's finished so I can have an endpoint. It'll be interesting to see what they, what they do with that. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.